All right, guys, welcome to another episode on the podcast. Got myself, Brian Gold, my boy Squints, and my good friend, Tony Blower. What's up, buddy? How's it doing, bud? Good. Happy to have you here. Yeah, I haven't seen you in a while. I know. It's been a whole, like... 12 hours. If even. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So you started this whole known fear thing with the whole martial arts background and everything, and it's also transitioned into a mindset of business. I want to kind of have you give a quick background about it, and then we'll dive into deeper questions. Yeah, so the... I guess the the origin story behind the whole no fear concept was was my passion and obsession almost of uh, self defense. Learning how to manage fear uh, was a huge part of that, and I didn't realize that in the beginning. So I started wrestling when I was really young, and uh, never won, but was always like highly rated. And I realized I didn't have the self awareness as a seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven year old to go, I was worrying about you instead of thinking about what I had to do. And I don't know if you guys ever read the book, uh, The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, Dan cool. Millman. I've, I've started ago. it. Yeah, I started it. Yeah. Check it out again. I it was, will. It was, uh, so it's decades old, but there's, uh, it's a great story. But this line actually, ironically, isn't even from the book, but just I became a fan of his philosophy and stuff. And he said, if you doubt, if you face just one opponent and you doubt yourself, you're outnumbered. I'll say it again because I screwed that up. Sorry, Dan. If you face just one opponent and you doubt yourself, you're outnumbered. And I thought, wow, what a heavy line. And I never realized as an athlete growing up, and I played all sorts of sports, that I didn't ever make the podium, even though I was good enough, because I was always worried about letting down my team. Uh, Am I as good as I think I am? Uh, Letting down my parents, whatever it was, I let that pressure get to me. When, when I was 12 years old, I got jumped by two guys as an introduction to, hey, welcome to high school. These two guys jumped me. Uh, I went home, I told my father, two guys just beat me up. Uh, and uh, he said, well, you gotta learn martial arts. There was one school open, it was 1973. And uh, it was a Taekwondo school. And I went in there thinking it would solve all my problems. I grew up in the 60s watching Mannix and the Green Hornet and Batman and all those, oh, mm-hmm. good stuff, all, the, good stuff. all the macho, you know, like karate chop mm-hmm. and everything. And, uh, you know, it was the guy gets the girl and, and violence solves everything <laughs> in all those yeah. TV shows, right? And uh, so I thought if I learned how to fight and defend myself, that would also change my relationship with fear. And I had altercations in high school like other kids growing up and then when I started to drive you know before road rage had a name you know like altercations and the same thing would happen tunnel vision auditory exclusion and whatever I did in the fight had nothing to do with what I was training in. Mm-hmm. and I was like I was like what the, the fuck is that like like why why can't I make this shit happen and uh, I accidentally started teaching self-defense and which is which is which is kind of interesting uh 1980 i'm working at my father's office and i'm sweeping and doing shipping in the in the back and i'm getting i think four dollars and 25 cents an hour the minimum wage he didn't like you know it was a family business he didn't come in and here's your suit and here's a corner office it was like welcome to the family business get in the back start sweeping so i started at the bottom and uh i was about to break into song there and the, um, I'm working out one day, you remember in, uh, in the original Rocky, mm-hmm. when he would be pounding the sides of beef, we would get these big boxes in from the Orient. And when we finished unpacking them, they were so big, I mean, literally the three of us could get in them and hide. But if you nailed it, like, like it was like hitting the beef, right? And so this is 1980, I think Rocky came out in 76. So it was like, that was, you know, yeah. I'd hear the music and I'd be wailing. One day I'm, I'm beating the crap out of this box, jump back, kick, side kicks. And they were literally huge. Like you couldn't, they wouldn't move when you'd hit them. And uh, I turn around and there's this guy, Joey, standing there. And Joey's one of my dad's biggest clients and a very good friend. I've known him for years. He says, hey, you're getting pretty good. And I've been doing now martial arts for seven years straight, fanatic. Before I would go brush my teeth, I'd roll out of bed. I used to have... Um, any of you ever done martial arts yep. in the past? A little bit, yeah. Remember Makiwara's big fancy, like the, the, the mm-hmm. fist knuckle toughening? Yeah. It was yeah. a Japanese name. I used to have one under my bed, so before I'd even go to the bathroom, 
I'd wake up in the morning, roll it out of bed, and I just start, I wanted my wow. knuckles to look like Joe Lewis. I don't know if you remember the great Joe Lewis. Mm -hmm. uh, he had huge knuckles, and I would be sparring in the air on the way to brushing my teeth, f obsessed with it. And uh, so it's 1980, and I'd always loved coaching. I taught a little tennis, taught a little, I've been I've taught skiing professionally. And Joey says to me, my son Mitch, who I knew, he said he's having a bully issue at school. I want you to teach him. I said, oh, okay, okay, cool. And he goes, uh, how much will you charge? I go, Joey, you're a friend of the family, so I'm, I'm not gonna charge you. It's for Mitchy, you know? And I'm 20, he's 15, this kid. And he goes, I want you to take this seriously. I don't want you to do us a favor. I'm gonna pay you. He goes, how's 20? So I do the math quick. I'm getting four bucks an hour, five classes. I'm doing martial arts. I have this. That's a blast, sure. He goes, so I'll pay you $20 a class. Don't be late, be prepared. And all of a sudden I do the math again. Did you say 20 bucks a class? And I'm like, holy shit. And that actually jump-started my whole business. Um, the Mitch's brother then wanted a lesson, Derek across the street, then they're, they live in a kind of a nice little uh, pocket of well-to-do people. I had, in about a month later, I had about 30, 15, and 16-year-olds wow. that I was teaching. And I kept working for my dad for several, several years, but I'd work seven days a week, a, a week uh, doing all these lessons. And, you know, when these, and they were good athletes, 15, 16-year-olds, uh, hockey players, football players, and they all want to learn how to fight. And it, it was nuts. I was experimenting this whole system on these guys. I uh, did that for several years, then op opened the school. But what happened with this kid with Mitchell, which is significant and pivotal to the whole, had a no fear start. Uh, the bully situation wasn't going away and I'm telling Mitch, I'm going, hey, the school's not doing anything. Your father's paying me. Cause he'd come, he's 15 years old. When can I fight? When? I go, Mitch, do you know to move your head properly? He go, not really. I go, do you know to throw a good punch? He goes, not really. Do you know to block? Not really. I, go, I suggest you don't get in a fight. You don't, you don't <laughs> you're, you're not ready. Like, ready. like, what are you doing? Like, but he's 15, he's anxious, yeah. right? And I said, look, just keep walking and talking. And I said, we're not doing anything retroactive, but he hasn't put his hand on Mitchell yet. It's all verbal abuse. So one day, about three months into our training, we're doing one private a week. So he's had like 12 classes, right? How good are you? I come to Mitchell's uh, um, next lesson and I walk downstairs and he's sitting in his room and you know the cartoons with the smoke coming out of the ears when yep. you're freaking, he's like this. And I go, what happened? And he goes, motherfucker, and he starts yelling at me. And I go, calm down, I go, what happened? He goes, I was late for class, I'm running to class and the guy tripped me, he's lying at the, and sitting on the locker banks at the back, lean back, trip me. I go flying, my books go flying, everyone's laughing at me and I lost it. And I grabbed all my books together and everyone's laughing and I start muttering, you fucking asshole. And he goes, what'd you call me? And I, he stood up and he got in my face and he poked me, he goes, what are you gonna do? And I didn't know what happened. I, he said, I grabbed him, I slammed him against the locker bank and I said, don't ever put your hands on me, which is ironic, right? When you're, stop screaming at me, like when you're like screaming that mm -hmm. back at someone. And I go, then what happened? He goes, he dropped me with a left hook. I go, Mitch, why didn't you do wax on, wax off? The karate kid didn't exist then, but yeah. something like that, right? I go, why didn't you parry? Why didn't you slip? Why didn't you block? Why didn't you do any of this stuff? We practice. And he looks at me, guys, and he goes, well, he says, I was holding him with my left hand like this, and I had my school books in my right hand. And as soon as he said that, it's like the god of self-defense hit me. I was like, holy shit. And I said this to myself, we, Collectively, we teach self-defense wrong. Yeah. The, the idea, if I said, if I grabbed you and I was holding stuff in my hand, how easy would it be for you to punch me in the face? Pretty Very easy. easy. Pretty easy. Yeah. What we don't understand also is, and this, this is something I discovered through doing scenario training for decades, there's a part of our neurobiology, and you've all heard of flinching, the startle mm -hmm. flinch system and the cross extensor reflex. If I'm holding stuff and you jumped up and punched me in the face, I would do this, I'd move away. You wouldn't but, drop your stuff. But my hands, exactly, they clamp down on what I'm holding. 
So, and that's why, like, at electrical school, school they'll, they'll teach electricians, hey, always, if you're checking a current or you're touching stuff, back your hand, because the cross extensor reflex will do this. And if that happens on a strong yeah. current, that's where they find you. Yeah. As opposed to, <clears throat> like, re recoiling from the back. And so this is a real thing. But so imagine when Mitch grabbed him, he was holding his books, and this guy started to launch. Any, any instinct switched. to push away danger turned into a contraction around the pulled shirt. It into him. And it pulled him into him. And he, got, and he got dropped. Well, I didn't know any of this. I'm 20 years old, right? But what I did in that moment, I said, we don't teach anyone about the scenario. We don't teach anyone about the emotional, psychological duress right before an event. And it clicked so quickly, like as a competitive skier, I'd be, I'd want a projectile vomit. I've already pissed in the woods five times. Uh, my, my coach would go, how do you feel, kid? And I'd go, great, I'd lie, great coach. And then I'd catch a tip or wipe out. And I was really good, really like, like you know, one of the top skiers in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, which is where I grew up, but could never podium because I would always go too hard. I could never find that proverbial flow state. Yeah. Uh, between act and action and it was because I was always thinking about don't wipe out as opposed to hey have fun going fast and um, so when Mitch lost that fight it was it was such a like a, a like a, this crazy epiphany big fancy word for light bulb moment mm -hmm. obviously and it was like holy shit and I didn't know but I, exactly why but I knew something big was happening and it, at that moment in 1980 I changed everything moving forward in self-defense it was always why are we doing this it was always a Socratic pause does this relate to something in real life and people started to get really really good because we weren't practicing technique we were practicing tactics running talking moving as the scenarios evolved and it was almost like a mini fight club we would get together, we would do scenarios, we'd, we'd talk about a scenario, you know, what we do if we were here and two guys walked in with guns and they would go, okay, let's, let's analyze that. Let's do, let's do it so it didn't have a good ending. Let's do it so it does have a good ending. Let's explore our thought process or moving. And what I realized what was happening was a term out of sports psychology called metacognition, where you, where you do super intelligent reps and you're pushing the envelope where you could fail, there's pain, there's discomfort, but you could succeed. And this was counterintuitive and very different from any martial art training. Super, and especially at the time. Yeah. Yeah, back and, then, none of that existed. No. And, and a lot of the neuroscience that explained it, like brain-based training, uh -huh. deep practice, myelinization of neurons, like that language didn't even exist. And I wasn't talking about it, I just had intuitively figured out a way to hack competence and skill acquisition. Yeah. By only doing scenarios, only doing sucker punch. Real world. Only, and, and it was action. nuts. Now, here's the big, my favorite word is serendipity. The big serendipitous thing about that is word got out that we were doing these like fight club-esque scenarios. People come in, they sign a waiver, and you come in and I go, Brian, what's your biggest fear? Let's say you said, uh, getting jumped by two guys at the bus stop, right? And uh, so there'd be 20 people in class and we're doing makeshift gear, you know, hockey helmets, hockey gauntlets, taekwondo chess guards. And then it'd be your turn. You'd see to suit up, which is stressful in itself because you know you're, you're about, I'm to, about get, to get in a fight, right? About and, to get there, and there's role players, right? And then you would have forgotten in your, in your onboarding or your intake that what you told me was your favorite, your, your worst fear. So I go, Brian, I got a new, an interesting scenario for you. You're at a bus stop late at night and then you'd see the guy's face go, oh, fuck, that's why they asked that. And these two guys <laughs> come up. And so it created this synthetic adrenaline dump. I got uh, goosebumps right now, yeah. like reliving this. The 80s were my incubator period. All my companies evolved, like my, my equipment company, uh, that we, like, is now like a big thing for SWAT and combatives. And uh, we had the US Army bought $17 million worth of the gear to assist their combatives program. Like yeah. this was huge. Yeah. That came out of this 1980s period. Uh, the spear system, which was the startle flinch conversion, weaponizing the startle flinch. So spear is an acronym for spontaneous protection, enabling accelerated response. And then um, the no fear, which I think is my most important discovery, because when we would do the scenarios, 
you know, we come in and there, let's say be 15 people in one se seminar and 20 in another. And for, you'd see, let's say a little girl sitting there, a little girl, like a, a, a young woman, clearly there for the cathartic purposes. Something had happened to her and she's sitting there all nervous. And then there'd be like another big guy, cauliflower ears, busted nose, sitting there like this. And if I said to you guys, who are you betting on? Cauliflower ear. Cauliflower ear, right? And then that guy might like tap out or quit in a scenario and she'd fight like a freaking badger. Yeah. And I, and I was trying to figure out, it wasn't size and it wasn't technique and it wasn't experience. As, and I was so curious about this, I would debrief, I'd get feedback. And I noticed that there was a line of thought when people like in their own after action I knew I couldn't let this happen again. And so I knew even though I was scared, you would hear that, even though I was scared, I said to myself, it was self-talk, but it was this idea that, that, that then became this term, the people that manage their fear manage to fight. It doesn't guarantee victory, but it guarantees you're in the fight, yeah. which changes your self-esteem, your confidence. Everything. If you lose after, you go, at least I fought, I yeah. tried. You didn't hold back. Exactly. And uh, so, so, when I discovered that, I started really looking into the psychology of fear. And I realized that everyone was talking about, like all the fear management research out there was um, very metaphysical, very esoteric. I want you to visualize this. I want you, and it wasn't like real time shit. And I was like, and, it would, and, all the, and a lot of the fear based talk was fears and emotion. And, uh, you know, our ancestors did this and your reptilian brain and the limbic system. It was all like, like pedantic language. I use that term on purpose because nobody knows what it means. Mm -hmm. But that's what it was. It was like it, it subordinated us. It kept us like, I don't know what they were talking about. And then, of course, fight, flight, freeze, which you guys, of course, have heard your whole life. Everyone's heard that. And I looked at that, and I don't know why I thought this, but I said, fight, flight, freeze are all post-mortem or, or, or forensics observations. I watch you fight, you ran away, I go flight. I watch you freeze, I go freeze. I watch you, you're fighting, fight. But it, it wasn't organized, it wasn't responsive, it was reactive. And I was like, is there a way that we can make this more deliberate? So I go, I'm, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, I'm gonna choose this. This is the optimal strategy because I'm a moral, ethical, legal-minded person, blah, blah, blah. And that kind of hypothesis began what first was our cerebral self-defense mental edge program. How do you make decisions under duress? And, and how do you differentiate between physiological fear, butterflies, you know, uh, you know, shifting from parasympathetic to sympathetic yeah. and like that whole anxiety state uh -huh. to psychological fear? Because you've all, you know people in your lives where body language being 60% of communication, you've walked into a room, you can tell something's wrong and you go, hey, what's up? And the person goes, nothing, why? Right? And they bullshit, either they have no self-awareness, they, they haven't realized what's happening. So psychological fear can debilitate us in our minds where we don't take action. And this, if we fast forward decades now, became the No Fear Program, spelled K-N-O-W, of course. Uh, and the hypothesis there is if we change our relationship with fear and we look at fear as that that ignition point to do some research on something that's outside our comfort zone, then fear becomes a fuel that we can consume and use to drive our education or drive our momentum or, or, or change our life. So if you change your relationship with fear, you change your life. 100%. Crazy. Yeah. So how have you taken that process and really switched it? Because I've heard you talk at Dan's thing about business and taking that fear and adapting it into your business life to grow your business or your marriage or whatever it might be. How are you getting people to do that mental shift? Well, we're still a boutique and all my business is, is word of mouth. We don't, I don't have a, um, a blimp flying over. Of course, that'd be really dangerous to have a balloon advertising your stuff these days. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, Th there is, I, I got a, like a bunch of examples on that. And it was funny, one, one guy that I trained in our hand-to-hand -hand stuff, a former Marine, you know, uh, battlefield tested, 
got into, got recruited into a business and found himself very successful at leading people, got promoted, and then was told, look, we want this division to do 50 million this year. And he called me up. He goes, I've had people shoot at me, I've shot at people. I've, I've, you know, once a Marine, always a Marine. He said, I'm scared shitless. And he said, your fear management helped me. And he told us a story of his daughter that was just melting down at the pressure of law school. And he took our protocol and talked her through it on the phone and like talked her off the ledge to the point where she went into the test the next day, aced it, everything's good, called me to thank me. And it was like, I have a, a, a psychologist who's part of our mobile training team for our self-defense stuff. Uh, his real job is as, as a, a psychologist. And when he started to learn this stuff, he calls me up, he goes, you know, this is more effective than anything I've learned in 20 years of psychology. He says, I'm bringing it into my practice. And he is now incorporating this to help treat people with PTSD. Yeah. All of this, because what I, in the 80s, I said, why is everyone making this so complicated? You're here, you're in the fear loop. When you're in the fear loop, you're not doing anything. You're like freaking out. And so you're wasting time, the only resource we can't regenerate. So fear management is also time management. And as I began to talk like that, business people would hear and if I say to somebody like, how important is sales in your business? You go, well, with no it's sales, like, we're out of business, right? <laughs> well, you know, but how important is marketing and how important is culture and how much, it's all important. But at the end of the day, right? For most businesses, you gotta have sales, right? right? Even if you're nonprofit, you're selling something. Yeah. And if the people pitching your ideas suffer from any type of like typical psychology of like rejection or numbers or quota, that's fear. And if you can't identify it, you can't coach them. So I just did um, this, uh, this group, I'm not gonna mention the name because I don't know if I can, but this huge investment group, one of the biggest in the world, they contacted me, I was just on their podcast uh, last week. And this is all like investment banking, investment and finances and everything. And they had discovered through their own research how big a factor fear is and how like fear when the market pivots really quickly of people selling too fast or holding too long or and, and we got into this crazy deep conversation but what people want to know Brian is they go but for me for my industry what do you have and I go fear is fear fear doesn't give a fuck yeah it doesn't matter whether you're fighting right? business it's it's you know what you need to do and then you get a fear spike. And a fear spike will always create doubt. Doubt will always create hesitation. Hesitation will always create procrastination. Even if it's this fast, I get up to, we finish the show, I get up to leave, and I do this, and I stop, and I go, where's my phone? And I forget that I le left it here. The moment that my reticular activating system, my brain said, there's something off, scan, and you're, oh, I forgot my phone. I don't get in the car thinking I forgot my phone. I actually stop where I am, and I start to like recycle where I came from, and then I go, oh, there it is, it's on the desk. You do that when you think you've left your key in a hotel room. How many times have we you know, walked out our hotel room door? And watch how interesting fear is. And please don't leave me hanging. Please tell me you've done this. <laughs> you, you, you close the door, and you're taking two steps out, and you go, your key, and at your door's closing, and you reach back in slow motion going, no. like. You guys done, done that? Plenty of times. Right? Course. But how stupid is that? Right? You can get a key at the front desk. Yeah. But our the fear spike makes it this dramatic life saving. No, my door. I yeah. don't want to have to walk all the way back right? down. Get right? A new key. Walk down, get up, or get it on the way out. But it's just so interesting that so something as simple as that little comical visual, a fear spike, unsolicited, something just happens. Yeah. There's no danger. Mm -mm. There's zero danger. You left your key in the room. You have Secure. the same feeling though. But it's like, oh shit, fear spike, startle yeah. flinch. Well, yeah. But that applies to everything. It's the everything. same reaction. It's the same reaction. And you can have a reaction, you know, I, I describe this lovingly that if, if uh, you've all gotten like a threatening email or an email that could be devastating, mm -hmm. right? And unless you've had a lot of reps with that, and fortunately most of us don't, like whether like a death threat or I'm gonna do this or I'm gonna sue you or whatever. Yeah. The first moment you read it, you're like, 
holy fuck. And there's a, a just this wave yeah. of nausea or yep. physiological change. Fucks up your day. And, but nothing's happened, right? And so an acronym that I love to share is false expectations appearing real. It's when we're visualizing an event in the future that's debilitating us right now. And, in, and it's the self-awareness piece that catches us anticipating this dreadful future event. And that, imagine if you had to negotiate right then. You guys remember Iggy Pop? Mm -hmm. So Iggy Pop, uh, old school punk rock from the UK. But he said, it's, it's one of my most favorite quotes. He said, imagine if desperation were attractive. Yeah. It's so heavy, It'd be bad. right? Yeah. So, you know, I come and I come to you, I, hey, Brian, man, how you doing? What's up? And you go, what, dude, what's up? Oh, nothing, listen, uh, hey, can you lend me some money? You're like, whoa. Yeah, Desperation. Hey, hey uh, are you married? Like, yeah. How many kids would you like to have with me? Whoa! Like, yeah. like the desperation is not attractive, and so the idea is like, dramatic fear, unresolved fear, creates an energetic desperation in people. Yep. And unless you're with people who really care about you unconditionally, that's like, stay away from me. Yeah. All of this ties to self-awareness when you study how to manage fear you uh, develop your self-awareness and self-awareness improves your critical thinking something that's sorely lacking on the planet earth 100%, right yeah. so greater self-awareness improves critical thinking greater self-awareness and better critical thinking improves situational awareness that makes you safer in a self-defense situation it also makes you a, a smarter business person mm -hmm. Meaning risk management, yeah, just you're, going, you're, yeah, kind of anticipating certain things, or or just seeing it, and instead of That's reading what it, it is. Yeah, yeah, instead of reading or knowing, you got to do the research instead mm -hmm. of reacting to the narrative, and but the only way you don't react to the narrative is if you've got self awareness, and so this was the um, you asked me about the business transition on the call last week. Their focus was on their traders and managing the fear of volatile stock market. And I said, that's true, but if I'm the coach of a baseball team, if I'm the coach of a baseball team, and I got my, my all-star batter who's striking out, I'm not thinking, man, I wish this guy would learn some fear management because he's clearly got the skills, he made the team. Right, it's not a technique, it's not like grip tighter, grip looser, yeah, try to change your bat. Yeah. There's it's something in his head, in his head yeah. right? But as the coach, I'm responsible for enhancing his performance. So I said to this guy in the business call, I said, it's great for your traders, but it's more important for their managers, and it's even more important for their leadership. Mm. Yeah. Right? Think of that. And so if if I'm asking you, you know, as as and I, I, I pop this up here because it's 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 such a great moment, uh, you might have noticed I have a tattoo or two. One and or two. and um, you guys should get them too. It's one day. Like, you don't have to fight if you have tattoos. It's just that's why <laughs> I, I have a bunch. I'm, I'm yeah. loaded. So there you go. It I definitely, it definitely makes people act differently towards you. Yeah. You think so? I think so. 100. percent People it don't can. act to me in public the way that they act to normal people. You know what I mean? Too like sure. Jen or anybody. I mean, yeah. I'm a man as well. But there's a certain look where somebody's like. They just, there's a respect thing that is probably like, maybe I don't want to go down this road. I, I agree with you 100%. Never I grew up around that. bikers and like other things and they're in less physical confrontations for a reason because people aren't you know, really trying to go it, down it, that it road can. and fuck oh, around and find yeah, out, yeah, right? Yeah. And, and although it's gotten, it's almost now like... The, where it is every, the opposite everyone has direction. It, yeah. but, yes. but you can tell, you can tell by yes. somebody how, how they yeah. carry themselves. But anyways, I was, I was making a joke because I've got a, a bunch of tattoos and, and my... Uh, he's become a good friend, um, uh, Aaron from Ghost Tattoo in Vegas. I've talked yep. to you about him. About a year ago, about a year into the craziness that has been the last few years of the weaponization of fear, uh, he calls me and he says his son Salem is exhibiting signs of anxiety and it's concerning him as a dad. He said wearing a mask in school, doing sports in school, not seeing anyone smile in school, the whole take a bite, put the mask down, all that. And he asks me, because I've got a digital no fear program. And for people who can't get to be, be there. in person, yeah. And uh, he says to me, um, is the no fear program too mature for him? I said, I don't, at the time I hadn't met his kid, I have now many times. 
And I said, I don't know Salem, so I don't know if it's too mature, but I know you, and you know your kid, and you're his coach. And I'm telling this story because I just finished saying about the, yeah. the investment thing. Mm -hmm. The leadership needs to recognize fear and make sure the managers understand how to coach fear. Because at the end of the day, if somebody is employed or in a situation, there's an assumption that they're, they've got the skill or their skill is building what will uh, stymie their success or hinder their success is if you face just one opponent, you doubt yourself, you're outnumbered. It's your relationship with the psychology of fear, not the physiology. So if you, George St. Pierre has started in, and you know, of course, who George is, one yep, of the greatest of MMA fighters. Um, and I knew George before he was Rush St. Pierre. I grew up in Montreal, I live out here now. Mm -hmm. But he used to come in, he's a Kyuku Shikai karate fighter. He'd come in and he'd bow to me because I, I was teaching in this eclectic training center there. And he called me Sensei Blower because I was in all the magazines and he knew me from there. He hadn't done any MMA, just a cute little anecdotal story. Uh, but he's come out now and said the worst day of his life is every day he had to fight because he was so scared. But when you think of George at 5% body fat doing the first Superman punch, yeah. punching BJ Penn or somebody in the face, I didn't going, see that. And you're going, I that guy's scared? That Did you guys know that Tyson used to cry and throw out before I've, a lot I've, of I've, I've actually heard Mike talk about that before. Really? Yes. Yeah, he yeah. was terrified of it. So, so imagine yeah. this. He so, fed off of fear. That's Tyson's yeah. thing, yeah. So, so imagine if before, and you didn't know who Tyson was, we open the door and, and he's leaning over a pail going, <laughs> throwing up. And I go, you want to bet on this guy? You'd be like, no. Because the world's relationship with fear is, is that fear is, is this pejorative, it's a negative. And that's my whole thing is like, my life would have been completely different if I had a mentor, a coach, a parent say, I noticed that you're afraid every time you compete. No, I'm not. Yeah, you are. Because you don't, what you do in practice and what you do in the game it's totally are totally different. Yeah, what's going on? Had my ski coach said that to me before a, a competition, just once instead of, how do you feel, kid? Great. I'd lie to him because who talks about fear? Yeah. And um, so all of this back to this this uh, this letter I got, and I bring it up because, and I'll I'll show it to you guys if you want. We'll zoom in or I'll get a picture of it. Part of it is like, when's the last time you got a handwritten letter? It's yeah, it's been a while. It's been you know, a minute. That's it's like a, a text. So I, I so backtrack. Aaron says to me, hey, no fear for my kid. I said, you're his dad. I said, you could have the current administration at your school teach him all about socialism and Marxism and other, other weird shit. Or you can coach him at home with the principles and virtues and, and the things that we want our kids to grow up with. So he does the program, gets the program, and a month later I'm back in Vegas and I go sit down and he hands me this handwritten letter. And uh, how old is the kid? 10, ten years old at the okay. time. And you've, I knew you guys want to read it? Yeah, I do. Read, read, read that to the audience mm -hmm. and I'll discuss that. It's just insane. Dear Tony Blower, thank you for giving me the tools to have a good mindset and for making me into a better person. Me and my dad have been listening to your seminars. It is helping both of us and I think that is awesome. I would also like to thank you for giving me the tools that help me be brave when I'm afraid to. Always practice courage and remember that courage is contagious. I'm excited to learn more and always move forward. Thank you very much, Salem Jackman. Isn't that insane? It's so, amazing. Yeah. So, From a 10 year old. So let me tell a 10 year old. So let me tell you this, and I'll say this on your show. I don't know your audience or your demographics are. I started crying in this private tattoo place. And then Aaron starts crying. So the two tough guys covered in tattoos are crying, and I'm going, dude. My allergies are really acting up suddenly, <laughs> right? Um, but I got goosebumps thinking about this, and I share it because there are a bunch of things. First of all, I had a, a very uh, distant relationship with my dad. And when I read in this, I go, this father and son, their relationship is gonna be stronger than ever. Because yeah. I never, I know, so I'm 62 now. Let's say that had somebody taught me to look at fear differently. Hey, those butterflies, that's anticipation and, and that's you getting ready to do something either dangerous that you have to do or exciting and you're worried about the outcome. There's nothing wrong with that, right? You gotta manage the fear. Had somebody explained that in a way that I understood, 
let's say that my journey, all the businesses that I built, my relationship, my three kids, my beautiful wife, that I still would have been here. I would have experienced all of that with less worry, mm -hmm. with less anxiety. And with, that worry will kill you in the long run. It's, uh, you know, you worry. I mean, the, the, the biochemical, the, the, the chemical changes in your body, the cortisol, the adrenaline, the, all that's, your body doesn't want that until it needs it for certain times, but you shouldn't be producing it all the time. And that's the movie in our mind. We're visualizing a future event, and that's really what anxiety is. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. Clinical or non-clinical, anxiety is just worrying about the future, which you can't control. 100%. So um, this thing here, this kid, and you know, I've, in fact, I was just chatting with his dad last week. You know, how's he doing? Doing great, blah, blah, blah. But it was transformative, but it wasn't just giving a 10-year-old a different way to look at fear. It was giving a 10 year old and his father and hopefully their mother, like a way to talk about the world. Yeah. And Giving them a safe structured. You know, right. Like this is, there's positive. a formula. Hey, I'm nervous about so Like I, I would do stuff. So I've worked with tier one military SWAT team stuff. And I would say things like, okay, guys, any questions? I'd be in a room, 12 SWAT team, private, private training. And I know that these guys have been in gunfights, knife fights, street fights, right? They've been on the job for 10, 15 years. Guys, any questions? Okay, let's take a 10 minute break and then uh, let's get back in here. As soon as we do that, guy would walk up to me. Hey, Coach Blower. I go, yeah? He said, I got a question. I said, I just fucking said, do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, so like, what, do you, what do you ask me? Yeah, I did one. So even somebody, and my throat's no raw. Even somebody who will fast rope down the side of a building with a gun, jump over an airplane with a dog, go into a gunfight, was afraid of public speaking. Mm -hmm. All of us have that Achilles heel. Yeah. I fucking hate public speaking. You've seen me right. flinch up. <laughs> <laughs> um, and part of it is just reps, but it's also just knowing what to think and self-regulate. One of my favorite lines from, from our training is, you can't be brave if you're not afraid. A lot of people never thought that the primary ingredient, if this was a bottle of courage, all of this is fear. Like if I ask you to do something that you're not afraid of, then no one can say that was courageous of you. But if I ask sure. you to do something where you go, man, really, do I have to do that? Yeah, come on, I need you to do this for me. Oh, fuck. There's elements of courage there. Yeah. So I'm fascinated by, the, by helping people understand the difference between imagine fear and real fear, and then recognizing that imagined fear and real fear can have the same debilitating effect on you. Didn't think of it that way. But why? Why let ourselves create that from the imaginary fear? Um, was that rhetorical or real? No, rhetorical, obviously. Yeah, 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 yeah of course. Yeah. Yeah. The, why would we do that, yeah. though? And, you know, but we all do that. The, we all do yeah, that. Yeah, of course I mean, we do. Yeah. My, you know, my, my, I've got three kids. Mm -hmm. my, uh, I texted my son today. And uh, the first one shows he goes through, you know, sent his text mes message. And uh, then I sent him another one saying, hey, man, I'm, I'm heading up to see Brian. Uh, you know, it was you know, great seeing you this trip. See you again soon. And this one doesn't go through. You know, like, why wouldn't one go through and not? Driving 15 minutes, my brain just starts to go. I'm a fear management expert. Mm -hmm. I go, that's weird. I message him again. Yo, everything cool? And I'm thinking, did his phone break and it's not going through? Is it on yeah. airplane mode? Did something happen to him? Like I'm a dad, right? Did something happen to him? And then a minute later, he messages me. He goes, hey, sorry, I was you know, in a bad area. But it was weird. Like the brain automatically and, takes over. And, and Yeah. So, you know, you, you, you know, you wake up in the morning and your tooth starts to hurt. You don't immediately go, hey, dentist. God, I missed you. It's been six months since I saw you. I got a, a, a mild uh, pain, right? We wait a day or two. And then we're going, man, I hope it's not root canal. I hope it's not my wisdom teeth. We start to worry about shit. And then finally we go to the dentist. He goes, why didn't you call me last week? Like, now you need antibiotics and whatever. My point being is, this is really how we're wired. 100%. To do stuff. Now, so my, my goal is to get people to go, wait a minute. The second I feel 
my physiology change because of an external or internal fear, I'm going to address it. So our mantra is like hashtag choose safety. What is the safest thing I can do? And that could be relationship, health, finances, self-defense. What is the safest thing I could do here? And then that decision is going to trigger a, a fear spike because you may have to do something outside your comfort zone. And now we come back to you can't be brave if you're not afraid. Yeah, and we all take risks in business. Like there's certain things you and I have done together. We're like, do we really want to do that? Or or lack thereof yeah. too that holds you back. It goes all ways. But at the at the the key point is that is addressing it, but and then taking, you know, it, the, the 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 beauty of this is that so fear is generic, right? So if you you obviously have some very good lawyers, you you call up a lawyer and you go, hey, I got a problem. He says, send me the email, right? And he goes, I got it. And you go, oh. but before that, you're like, man, I'm not fucking doing it. I'm like, you're, you're like, and then somebody who understands that problem says, I got it. It and could it, be a doctor going, your elbow's going to be fine. We're going to do this. Yeah. Um, so it's a uh, it's a curious thing it's an interesting thing but the idea here is this is that when we're in the fear loop we're consuming time when we're in the fear loop it's changing our physiology our, our chemistry and a lot of that stuff isn't that good some of it's necessary yeah because it's a uh, there uh, the stimulus happens our body has to you need some kind of reaction to know right but that reaction is also like the bat signal like okay I, I gotta do something it's like something's calling what a lot of us do, unfortunately, uh, in, in different parts of our lives, so like you can be a unicorn in business and, or a unicorn in vi managing violence or a unicorn in, you know, uh, I mean, look, look how many people from the acting world have destroyed their lives when, you know, things didn't go right, right? Yeah. Or, or athletes or business or even, you know, stock market crashes. And, and people are killing themselves or doing like crazy shit. Mm -hmm. That's all fear. Yeah. That's all fear. Acting a certain way. So it, it's so part of this is whether you're interested in this for business, for personal development, for professional development, fear plays a noxious, like a, like an invisible, almost, almost like carbon monoxide. You don't smell it. You don't see it. Yeah. And it's like, why'd you miss that putt? I kind of bet too much money on that one. Right. Or, or it could be anything. What? Why, you know, why are you still married? Why are you in that job that you hate? Yeah. When I talk to entrepreneurs and, uh, and I talk to them about when they made that pivot to let's start, start off on their own, I go, what, the, the, what was the timeline between the first moment you went, I hate my job, I got to get out, I got to do this. Like, was it the next day? Usually it's like five years, seven yeah. years, yeah. 10 years. Like people who are in bad relationships, right? all sorts of those. But it's always, it's, it's never like a few days later. It's always years. So think about that. Well, it either has to be really bad. I was watching another program about that too. It's also, it's like a bad relationship. Obviously, if it's extremely physically abusive, then they tend to... All right, I have to take a stance and go but, the opposite way. But, but statistically, way. They, if you do they, the research, they, they usually stay, stay there actually. because of fear. You yeah. leave me, this is going to happen. It's true as well. It's a fuck the, up cycle. Yeah, bad but, there, but, definitely. But the, I, I, the, like the animated graphic I want everyone to see right there with what you talked about, what you just inserted there, is that we've got a, a negative stimulus. We're in the fear loop. And the only resource we can't regenerate is time. And the longer you're in the fear loop, the longer, if you visualize you're, wasting it, it. The longer you're wasting time. That's why... And if you think about it, like, oh, here's a fun question is how much does fear weigh? Like if I send you uh, an email and I put an attachment, it says, oh, this is like, you know, one, you know, 40 kilobytes or, or this is, you know, one meg. And it was like, I remember, Super heavy. I remember thinking, uh, there was an article, I think in Scientific American called how much does the internet weigh? The cloud. And it's like one of these like weird things because like think about the size of all your files and it's up in the cloud like how much is it? it was like one of these like okay but it made me think what is fear way because if you're waiting for good news or bad news and then the doctor calls and goes you're okay 
you always stand up. You always go, oh my God, you always stand up. If you got, like, you're waiting, you know, someone's gonna do there the deal. There's a weight on you. You're, yeah, and you're so, and then it goes, hey, we're in. You, you get good news, you, jump you always up. stand up. And so the weight of fear, it changes our posture, our emotional yeah. posture. Oh, yeah, people shrink in or- Our physical, exactly. They get loud, you know, there's so, different ways. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting thing where you don't realize like this Blower talking about fear, fear. I don't fear anything. No, no, no. And people who I don't fear anything have things that they don't understand what they fear because you clearly don't need to pound your chest and say, I'm not afraid of any man or I'm not, I have no fear. All of us have that Achilles heel. And that's why, um, that's why I say it, it's that self awareness piece where you realize I'm a unicorn in business, but I'm shit in relationships. That's why I've been married nine times. Right? Or, or I'm horrible with managing money, but I can make it, but I always lose it. And it's figuring out all that stuff. But all of that is self-awareness and critical thinking. And most people won't lean into that because of the psychology of fear. It's, this is just uncomfortable. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a real paradox. It is. How long does it usually take someone like you to break through, let's say you're coaching me? Mm -hmm. that fear element for you it'd be a long time just because i was stubborn <laughs> oh, but the, the uh you know that's a great question it's literally like you know you know the old martial art expression when the student is ready the teacher appears it can be like a light switch for people it can literally be i had a guy uh, who had me on he's got this uh, cool uh, podcast called the secure dad and it's all about being like a, like the security conscious for protect your family your identity and he had me on and uh, he hits me up after he says, um, he says, uh, uh, I'm going to do the program. About, I think it was like a week and a half later, he messages me. He says, I've never told anyone this, but for a while now, I've had mild anxiety. It's about my future, about the business. And it's always worrying about the future, mild anxiety about stuff. And he said, I listened to your program and I made pages of notes. And then I listened to it again and I made more notes. And it was like peeling an onion. And I listened to the program, it's like a 97 minute digital program. And he says, I've, I've listened to it five times and uh, a week's gone by. He says, I don't think my anxiety has manifested at all. Like I like, this is, week has been amazing. And he ends this message with, is it possible that doing this has eliminated my anxiety? And I answered him, I said, well, if I were your therapist, no, because I need to keep seeing you every week uh, for several years because I'm getting a new house. <laughs> and uh, I said, but dude, like, why can't it? Like, I don't know you. And that's the neatest, the coolest thing is like someone go, I'm afraid of violence. I'm afraid of business. I'm afraid of sales. I'm afraid of public speaking. Can you help? And I go, yeah. And they go, oh, you have a program for public speaking, for public speaking. I go, no, I'm just going to teach you how to think about fear. Oh, you don't have a, a like a special no it's still the same it's it's a fear spike it crosses over yeah and it it um you just made me uh think of another story i gotta share the uh so this guy like for him it was like five listens an investment of what's five times 97 minutes you know so you know like a, f a few days later but what would happen would be like you know oh i'm afraid of this bottle wait a minute what am i afraid of so we have an acronym I should have worn this shirt. I didn't realize you guys were this cool. But I have another shirt that says fuck fear. It says fuck fear, no fear. Um, fuck fear is not me just being some crass American swearing guy with tattoo. Fuck fear is an acronym. Face it, understand it, control it, know it. I get a fear spike, I gotta face it, it's not going away. Toothache, financial, relationship, business, scaling, whatever. It's not going away, face it. In facing it, I'm forced to understand it. Let me do some research. Let me call my friend. What do you know about this? Who do you know that get that Google, YouTube buddies, whatever, mentors. Then control it is the tricky one because when people hire me or do our stuff, they, they want some sort of, they don't say this, but they want some sort of guarantee that when I'm done this course, I'll have no fear and no oh fear. And I go, life's a fucking roller coaster ride. <laughs> There's always going to be fear. It's the question is how long are you going to stay afraid in the fear loop? And there's this assumption that they'll, when they learn this, they go, so 
I get to know fear. No, you get to know fear and use it as fuel. And that's the fascinating thing. So I go, there's lots of things in life that you need to do afraid. Maybe ask your wife to marry. I remember how scared I was my second marriage, going, am I gonna do this? This is the last time, you're like, you start the past, the future. Okay, and you're nervous. I remember my kids giving birth. Please let them be healthy. Please let everyone be, you know? And I'm nervous. And just like today, my son's 32. Why didn't he answer me? Yeah. I didn't go, I'm not a worry wart. I didn't go, if he doesn't answer me in 10 seconds, I'll start to worry. I was just thinking that was weird. Nick didn't answer me. We were just texting, he didn't answer back. And I don't control the unsolicited thought, but if I recognize it, I can stop and go, shut the fuck up. I know what you're doing. You're in the movie in my mind. You're the director, you're the producer, you're the screenwriter in the movie in your mind, and you've cast yourself as victim number one in your fucking horror movie, yep. right? Or you can go, I'm, I'm getting out of this movie. This is a shit movie, right? Give it a run to make a review of like fucking 10, get the fuck out of here. And it's literally, that's, that little metaphor there is the power of it. This is a movie I'm producing. And if I can control that movie, but the, the last two parts of the fuck acronym, the control is, is you may need to do a bunch of reps for this before, like you hate public speaking, I'm gonna work on you with on you some stuff. So so m more of your sense of humor and your expertise, your knowledge comes out. Uh, but you'll do you know it's like it's like a fighter. His first fight and his tenth fight, he's got the same completely. skills, but he's completely different emotionally. It's the on game day, you're not technically a better athlete. On game day, it's all emotional psychological control. Uh, I had a, a semi-pro athlete call me up and they knew, I get referred to through different people as the Anthony Robbins of self-defense. So I think that's a compliment. <laughs> that I think he's compliment. got some, yeah. some yeah. cool shit. And uh, she calls me up, let's call her Natalie, because that's her name. And uh, she calls me up, she goes, hey, um, I got a competition on Saturday and every Wednesday, like clockwork, like the fear comes, I can't sleep, I don't eat, I know that my performance on Saturday is gonna suffer greatly because I'm not eating properly, not sleeping. I still do well, but I imagine, and so um, they're now married, but her boyfriend at the time, Casey, knew about me. Casey said, you, you know, w could you help me out? I go, absolutely. We're like on a Zoom call, I'm looking at her. I go, so tell me about this. She goes, when this fear hits, it's like, I'm gonna die. I go, literally? She goes, literally. I go, okay, and how long have you had this? She goes, like 10 years. So I take a pen, I pretend to write it down so she can see me. I go, I need you to be accurate here because this is gonna help with how I fix you. You're, the fear comes, you wanna die, literally. In the last 10 years, how many times have you died from the fear? I need the exact number. And she looks at me like, like on the Zoom call, like, well, I've never died, obviously. Oh, because you said literally wanna die. So I thought you were literal. So you haven't died yet from the fear. So she starts laughing. I said, listen, Natalie, and I tell her the movie thing. I go, here's what you're gonna do tonight. I go, you got a favorite old movie? She goes, yeah, let's say it was Casablanca, I don't remember. I go, cool, you got a favorite old book? Yeah, Gone with the Wind, whatever. Get them out, and when your physiology starts to change, because the fear isn't coming from like, like the ghost of Christmas, it's in your fucking head. Yeah, exactly. It's Wednesday and here it comes. When you start to feel your physiology, so you go from parasympathetic to sympathetic, your breathing will start to change, you get some butterflies. I want you to pretend, imagine where the fear is and go, hey, come here you little fucker, I've been waiting for you. You're not gonna fuck up my night, we're watching Gone with the Wind and when I've done that, we're gonna read, you know, Casablanca or vice versa, vice versa, I screwed that up, right? But um, I go do that. She goes, are you serious? I go, yeah. Make fear your friend. Change the relationship. Change the, the power dynamic. Because you're creating it, so you own it. Yeah. But you won't be able to eliminate it right away because this is experimental. I said, call me tomorrow. She calls me in the morning. She goes, I don't even remember falling asleep. Holy shit, I'm doing that again tonight. Right? And it was just, but it wasn't, that's why the C and fuck is control it. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, it's F-U-K. 
right? We've eliminated it because it's coming back. Yeah, and and like I've been in, in like I've been doing like self defense demos for years. I had a guy. I was I was in this uh, this hall, small like a uh, uh, billiard hall, doing a martial art thing, and there are forty people there, and I usually pick the biggest guy to do certain demos with. So I see somebody, I'm about to do my demo, and I see somebody at the back who's like head and shoulders above everybody. So I go, sir, can I get you to come up here, please? He goes, yeah. And I expect him to start moving and walking, but he stands up. He was leaning against the pool table at the back. In other words, he was three feet taller than I thought. And as he stood up, literally, the, <laughs> if, I, if I say literally again, like I went, oh my God, this is my last demo ever, I'm getting killed. Like he was, he was yeah. huge. Fortunately, it was so crowded because it, it took him about 30 seconds to get to me where it gave me enough time to get my shit together because I'd never seen a human that big. <laughs> and I'm like, literally, if I say literally again, punch me. I, I, in my mind, I saw myself doing my normal go-to demo here and it not working and the guy going, oh, and just crushing me. And then all these people going, that was shit. And then lead, like, <laughs> and I'm visualizing that event. This is the end of me right here. This is the end of me. And, you know, it was just, I just started laughing when he, when he got, you know, he got there because you're controlling the demo. But, but I share that because people think, you know, I get introduced at certain events. Hey, you know, world renowned fear management expert. Nah, 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 nah. And the first thing I tell them, I go, look, um, you know, I'm scared to talk to you right now, a little bit nervous about whether you're gonna like this stuff, I want the outcome to be good, so let me share my fears. And people are like, what? It's totally disarming. Yeah. Because, like, I've done talks to, like, the a board of psychiatry at a hospital where every one of these people are PhDs. And I'm in the parking lot before that, like, dry heaving because I'm so nervous going, what are you doing? Why, why did you take this gig for 12 guys that are psychologists and psychiatrists? You talk, pick, you pick apart your whole, your whole program. And yeah, and that's what I was thinking. Yourself, and they, they sat there for 90 minutes like with legal pads doing this. And I said, any questions? And I'm thinking, I'm literally thinking, this must have sucked because they didn't interrupt me and they didn't write anything down. And their chair looks at me and goes, uh, he goes, where, where did you come up with this and I knew holy shit they were interested yeah. and I so I'm a sarcastic prick I said well you while you were memorizing Jung and Freud I was interviewing victims of violence and that's true this whole system evolved out of what inarguably might be the scariest day of our lives yeah. sudden extreme violence lots of things can happen to us that are scary but there's only one event that can happen where you don't even time to dial 911. You stub your toe and you think you're, you want your doctor to fix it, you can call your doctor and he says, come over, I'll see it right away. You can't, broken toe, Brian, you know, suck it up, but I will, I'll come see you because you're being a pussy right now, right? Your roof, your roof starts to leak, the wife calls, the roof's leaking. You can go, I'm gonna YouTube, I'm gonna do it myself, I'm gonna show I'm a man, and you could YouTube how to do that right yeah or you can hire somebody car breaks down how do i fix this or you can hire somebody break a tooth i'm going to file this myself you know or you can go to the dentist and i make the joke because every calamity big or small there's a subject matter expert that can help fix it except for sudden violence yeah and so why i bring that up because this isn't really about self-defense other than in the spiritual emotional sense like what is self-defense if I can't if I can't protect my thought myself from my thoughts or my family from the weaponization of fear and tell them how to think or protect my business I come back to that you know I like one of my one of my team is always making she works her ass off but she's always making mistakes because she operates in the fear loop and I've she's been with me for 10 years so she's not going anywhere because I care about her and her family but I'm like I need you to understand, like our specialty is managing fear. I need, you to, I need you to understand that that's what we do because yeah. this mistake, so even there, but it's like control your fear. It's not, oh, I have no fear. No, it's and just managing it. What can, what can someone do um, 
in that in the face of extreme violence or this moment you know the worst the worst case possible you know what what is something that you it, it depends on the scenario yeah, obviously, obviously they change. and 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 you know something i've said twice you the people who manage their fear manage to fight yeah in most in most scenarios the people who don't survive and i'm not judging somebody who didn't survive but a lot of times there's a, an element of cooperation which creates hesitation in the someone comes up there's usually a moment where somebody can act and change the course of the yeah and, and and obviously we can't talk about those events where you can't yeah of course right but there's there are are situations i call it the three eyes instincts intuition intelligence but if you're locked up like you got like emotional inertia because of extreme psychological fear um it didn't matter that we had a talk on strategy do this distract the person here and then do that um the, that uh, doesn't you're not even recognizing any of that stuff yeah so i could all I, the training goes it out all the just went in the trash can just, real yeah. quick because because <laughs> like like which I, is a lot with the martial art background that you have i mean what do they say it's all good until you get punched in the face yeah. and you know how you're going to react to that right. being in the fight right yeah a lot of people think joe lewis said that the great joe lewis uh, sorry a lot of people think that mike tyson said that yeah he's best known joe for it but it was joe lewis the yeah. great boxer joe lewis yeah it changes everything yeah. when you get punched right in the face. you know and 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 there's another famous military maxim i'll paraphrase is like no 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 plan sustains first contact meaning you know you whatever your whatever your strategic plan was first contact you're you're adjusting you're you're That's improvising it. immediately yeah uh, there's another great general uh, gray from the marine corps said uh he wrote a, a little book called thriving on chaos or thrive on uh, chaos but he said the fight is only over when the opponent has lost the will to resist but a lot of these things if you think about them they're emotional psychological things are not about oh Physical i did an arm bar or i threw an uppercut or i you know the mind navigates the body literally mm -hmm. there is no such thing as muscle memory even though the world uses that term muscles don't have the capacity to store memory no. and and so you know it's it's you've got you know motor engrams you got neural patterns you got myelinated neurons but what you've got are, are neural patterns that are connected to your self-awareness and your situational awareness so i we have a course called concealed carry combatives and what we're showing people is in in the moment of that that confrontation like if i suddenly leapt across and went to attack you and if you're carrying a knife or a gun or pepper spray as a, as a, an, a like an everyday carry self-defense option get to it Probably well, not. But here's the thing cases. is the startle flinch. So violence loves speed. This is a quick pivot from fear management to, yeah. to tactical yeah. mindset. But it's all it's all understanding yeah. our body's organic use of fear. So the body's organic use of fear is to deploy the startle flinch to protect the head. And so that's like a biological airbag. That's my whole spear system. It's like, holy shit, all fights are dangerous, but the most dangerous fight is an ambush. So let's say you've got 90 weapons on you and you're going, this guy's kind of creepy. And I say, hey man, can I ask you a question? And you go, sure. And I go, and I attack. Your conscious cognitive awareness was compromised. You're surprised by the sudden attack. You've all flinched in your life. Oh yeah. Think about this. Think back to all the times you flinched, which you can't, but you know you did. Mm -hmm. You have never ever thought, I need to flinch. Flinching is non-conscious. Uh -huh. 100%. Think about that. Yeah. So your brain knows that it was compromised and goes, what the fuck, right? And does this. It could be a spider and you go, Duh! right? It could be a snake and you, it could be someone says, look out and your hands come up. So could there's be something that's not there at all. Yeah. But your brain thought it saw something, of course. You, yeah. you hear a noise and you're, yeah. you, you're, you're right. So, you know, I make a joke. Oh, you got a knife, you got a, a flashlight, you got, you got your gun. When you flinch, your hands come up. You're not grabbing And unless out. your weapon is duct tape to your hand you it's somewhere on you so what you need to do is you need to manage the fear spike convert the flinch but which is a a dual kind of an inter an interleaving process they're they're connected and the mind navigates the body and and so this is what we teach in sudden violence how do we weather the ambush how do we create space a quarter a quarter extremity push away danger deploy this by bio, this biological airbag create that space and uh, and so fear management can happen in the moment but like stamina endurance it's best done in advance like i can't be you're chasing me right and i go oh my god i can't run and i go i, mean, I wish i had more stamina endurance well 
<laughs> it's a little late for that. Yeah, it's <laughs> late. That that type of energy Self -awareness system. Self awareness of to, there's something off. Well, every I need to create. Yeah. A little bit of space between myself. So so what's interesting about what we said there is I've been interviewing victims of violence and victors of violence for decades. Every single victim of violence who lived to tell the tale said they had a bad feeling before the attack. Of course. So think about that. Every single time. You're already, you're so if if a hundred percent of the time you were right in the stock market, how successful would you be? If 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 a hundred percent of the time you got a hit, uh, uh, like you got on base in in baseball, you'd be like be MVP ever. all the time, yeah. the best ever. Fifty percent yeah. of the time, you're you're winning awards. Hundred yeah. percent. But a hundred percent of the people who live to tell the tale said, you know, come to think of it, I knew something was off. Their body knew already. Something felt. Exactly. So we call that the three eyes, instincts, intuition, intelligence. So if you ask me, hey, give us, give my listeners a, a few things to think about. If you got a bad feeling about something or somebody in business in a relationship, investigate it. That's our true safety model. If I think you're stealing from me and we're new in a relationship and I go, man, this is really uncomfortable. I'm a little bit nervous. I feel my heart is pounding, but I can't, I don't know who else would be, but like we're missing money and you go, you ever seen like somebody who like murdered their family or did something and they're being interviewed on, on the news and you look at the TV and you go, that fucker did it, right? Because yeah. you, you just like, they're lying poorly. If I, if I said to you, you know, Brian, I, I, you know, empty your pockets. I think you, you took my, you know, my thing. You look at me and you go, dude, this is the, one of the biggest insults I've ever had. I'm going to do this to shut you up. But I'm really, you and I have to have a talk about our fucking relationship. If you got like really animated and, and, and protected about our relationship and offended, I, that would be a consistent reaction. If you started doing, what are you talking about, man? I didn't take your, like, someone, man, and me being very, very cartoony. In other words, if I suspect something in business, and this happened to me, I lost control of a $12 million company in 2010 because Mr. Fear Mansion was afraid to, to open front. Pandora's back, yeah. box. I went to my COO, who was in on it, and I said, hey, what's going on with this, this uh, title change here with this friggin' company for the patent of this, and it was a bunch of things, and he looked at me and answered really quickly, he says, the tax benefit for our other guy has nothing to do with this, it doesn't affect us. And I go, it was a fast answer, but it made sense. This guy was a guy I hired, but he had already done the deal with my, my partner. And, and uh, a week later, I had to dissolve the company. And launch. But when I look back at all the pre-contact cues, just like in violence, they transferred the name here, they did something with one of my patents on my gear, and next thing they know, they're saying, hey, we're taking the equipment company and we're giving it to these people, and it was an asset transfer, I got no money. And when I went, I hired IP, my lawyer obviously. and I went to do all this stuff. They said, dude, you know, unfortunately I was in Virginia, a commonwealth, their laws were completely different. Mm -hmm. And they said, you know, uh, unless you got like millions of dollars, you're kind of fucked. And even then you're kind of fucked. And, and I just share that because once again, you had the indicators. I had all the indicators, but I went, I don't want to know. Anyways, I'm off on a crazy tangent. No, back but that's to the violence. Right. No, that's right where but, it is. But the, but this is what's happening where you think you're being followed. 100% of or the time. Or you think you're something and you go, there's the cognitive dissonance, the cognitive... We like, second guess our innate, natural dude. ability all and day long. We do Every it, time right? I failed in business, I went against my gut. 100%. 100% batting average, I went against my and gut. There's been times I've been fearful of things that didn't turn out to be true. Yeah. But... You know, a lot of the time, somebody or something or something felt wrong, and, and, and the result was what I had expected from this moment. But, but this is with what you said. Imagine if we had a system, and we do now, if, if you had a system that went, I just got this really weird feeling about this person or this place or this thing. What's the question? What is the safest thing I could What's do right now? The safest yeah. thing is I can investigate this or explore this. How do we do the homework? On? And then, yeah, exactly. Let's, let's, no, he's a good guy. He's a, we did a handshake deal. Right, and and like every every time, you know, I've been screwed over three times over three decades in, in business, or every ten years, which I, I learn is consistent with, mm -hmm. with most people. But for me, I'm a romantic. I'm a nice person. I like I want the world to be safer. Good about the world. Exactly. Yes, I understand. And uh, that explains the candles last night. It did. <laughs> <laughs> the uh, um, 
the uh, now you got me thinking about that again. <laughs> um, but in all those times, I I knew I needed to have that conversation and talk about this, and maybe have the NDA or have the the whatever or the talk. And I went, you know what? It'll be fine. I'm yeah. romantic. I believe in them. We don't need that today, right? And uh, you know, just it's it's like, and I said this earlier. Most people think of self-defense as managing violence. We don't think about violent thoughts, which are, I, I suck, I'm not going to be good at this, I'm not going to be a good father, I'm not going to be a good mother, ah, I fucked up this deal, what am I going to, you know, hey, I need you to fire the employees, I can't do it, you know, we, I screwed this up and I'm not going to do a salary cut, let's just let them go, right? And we rationalize and we, we hypothesize, we, we do all these things. But if we could just say, what am I afraid of? And then that's the C in fuck fear. I'm going to face it. I'm going to understand it. And then I go, no, you need to do this. And now it's like, man, I, I got to have this really uncomfortable talk and I'm really fucking nervous about this. And that could be, let's go to therapy. Let's, let's get divorced. Let's, let's, uh, I'm, I'm scared of expanding the business and giving up control. I mean, I've Usually when you face it, the outcome is not what you expect. Exactly. Ever. And, for and anything, with your wife, with your yeah. kids, with your friends, because everyone business feels it. Fears, and that's yeah. the line that, and, that it, and, it, and it creates an anger and all types of animosity inside sure. of ourselves, having these little and it eats you up, and you think this worst fucking thing's gonna happen. Could have been two weeks of leading up to something that could have been, been done in, in a, two in a, or, in a, or in two a second yeah. of just hey, I don't feel right about this. This is something and, and, bothering me. And, here. And, yeah. and and we've never We're had a situation a exactly. Yeah. We've never had a situation. No one's ever said, you know. I waited really, really long, and that created a better outcome. Like, there's no good time to have a kid, a kid, or start your business, or you know, like you just got to take the bull you, by the horns and you go. just go. Yeah, it's and, never going it, to be right. You and do it's it. and it's relative to all of us. But this this idea, the whole no fear metaphor, is you'll make the shift or the step when you're ready, and then when you look back, you'll when you understand that this future outcome is better. Because I finally, you know, jumped into it. I, I leapt. You realize, well, that took me five years to get to here, or it took me five months. And how can I accelerate that moving forward? And it's just a, that simple thing. Whether it's physical self-defense or spiritual self-defense or psychological self-defense, it's how do I recognize there's something off? That's the intuition part. Mm -hmm. The next step is what is the safest thing I could do? Here's a real controversial one. And, and, you know, we've turned it into kind of a meme maxim. I go, sometimes the safest thing that you can do is to fight as hard as you can. A lot of people think Running. and confuse safety is the same as playing it safe. Yeah. And it's not. Playing it safe is dangerous and actually kind of boring. Sometimes the safest thing might be, you're in an active shooter situation, the safest thing might be run out the door. The next safest thing might be barricade. The next safest thing, depending on proxemics and who you're, who you're with, might be Engaging. charging the threat. Yeah. But all, f all three are options. If I say to you, you're in an active shooter scenario, and you can do one of these three things, which is the safest, the answer is always going to be to disappear. Yeah. But then I always say, well, what's the scenario? And I've done this in our shooting class where I'll say to a guy, you know, what would you do? You're standing outside of a restaurant and you hear gunfire in the restaurant, would you run in with your gun into a crowded restaurant as a trained concealed carry holder? And you go, no, you, you would stage, you would call the police, you Which would usually set, up a, very set, bad, up, right? set up a uh, perimeter. We've a seen of, this recently yeah. that it doesn't end up well when people don't act in those situations. Yeah, and, and, but, but the idea is also, you're only imagining what you're doing. Yeah. And then you're going to a class where someone's going, this is the pro safest protocol. And that's all theory too. Uh-huh, because it's not actual. So the pressure's there. The pressure's there, but here's what I said to the guy. I go, that's good. You staged on the outside. You create a perimeter. You don't want friendly fire. You don't want cops showing up, guy with a gun, and they see you standing there and, and engage you, right? There's a lot to think about here. And the guy's like, oh, that's cool, okay. And then I said, okay, so... Good, you handle that scenario, you didn't run into the restaurant and get in a gunfight because there's maybe a hundred people in the restaurant, you don't want to start shooting. If there's other people with concealed carry there and they see you with the gun, I mean, this is a shit show. So I said, good job. Okay, let's change the scenario. 
Are you happy with his answer? Stage, wait for the police? No. Uh, what would you do? You would go in? I'd go in. Okay. Um, even though you haven't seen the inside of the restaurant? Okay. Figure it out. Interesting. Um, what I did then is I said to the guy, same scenario, but you're late for dinner and your wife and kids are already there. They're in the restaurant and now there's an active shooter. He goes, I'm going right in. Right, so all yeah. so so the difference is, you know, you're in, you're in, you're one's in, you're not in, his problem, involved, one's not right? his problem. Right, right. So you can you can change like one little factor, you know. There's there's a, a school of thought like without they, even thinking about yeah. it. Yeah. you think somebody's boom, you suddenly I gotta go. Yeah. So you know, I walk up to you in the street and I go, give me your money, and you go, hey man, what's in my wallet that's worth my life? Why should I fight a guy? He's already got the weapon out. But what if that? What was in your wallet represented your whole life. Your fighter. Right? That is your life. Right. So meta metaphorically, you know, and it, it, it's more the metaphor that we're uh, like, I hate when people say, do this, don't do this. I describe us like all our, 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 all of the products and services we do. I say we're options facilitators. We're just going to explain like all these different outcomes, but you need to decide. And how do you decide what is the best thing for you in that moment? You need to manage your fear. Because if I said to you, you know, where do you want to go for dinner? What do you want to eat? The hesitation of like, hey, should we go? Should we have sushi or should we have steak? Well, that's not scary and problematic. It's still a fear based decision. I don't want to choose incorrectly. And that might seem like the stupidest example. But remember what I said, any amount of fear, even if it's not dangerous, and you could say, I have no fear in choosing dinner, but you go, so pick one. No, no, you pick. I tell you, like at the, at, the, at the funniest level, I go, there's an element of psychological fear of- To of, everything, I almost think. every decision you make. And every so, day. exactly. Everything we do all day long. And, and, that and, moment of, and if oh, we, I almost drop a glass. I almost gonna do this. Oh, I gotta watch Exactly, and if we have fun with it, if, if, we, if we suddenly yeah. recognize that, we start making decisions faster. Yeah. I start going, you pick, you pick. I go, fuck it. Manage your fear and pick. Fuck you, we're going for steak. Fuck, I wanted fish. Fuck you, we're going for steak. But what it is, is we got off the X. Correct. Well, yeah. as we wrap this up, what's one thing you'd want to leave the viewers with? Um, I, 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 I said it early and I want to really close with it. You can't be brave if you're not afraid. A lot of us don't, have never realized that Yin and yang. Yeah, that, That's that what it is. the courage, the, the, we all want to be brave in our life. You, sure. We see something on TV. We admire on the news. bravery. Exactly. In America, America we, is brave. America, we, the brave, everything exactly. that we've been taught. And, and, you, and, see, I mean, and you see something in world, the news. You see something view. in the yeah. news. You see something on TV where somebody saves a kitten, saves an old lady, yeah. uh, runs into a burning building. And if you think to yourself, I wonder if I would have done that, then you were afraid, right? Would I have acted that way? Would I have in that shooting, in that fire, in that car accident? And a lot of it is training, but you know from people we know, yep. there are trained people that even hesitate. There are trained people that, and that's the psychological fear. And, and so whether I'm working with a tier one group, a full-time SWAT team, a part-time SWAT team, uh, a, a mom and pop, a, a, a family, a, a Zoom consultation, it's all about changing the relationship with fear. And if we admire, I think everyone universally, like every person I, I'd, like to, I'd like to believe would, would go, if I had a choice to be brave, and here's an interesting thing, what's the opposite of cowardice? What's, what comes to mind? The strength. Strength. Is the, strength. Uh, Bravery. Uh, um, so the, so when, you, when you think about the opposite of cowardice, and if I had a, a whiteboard here, I'd do this in our classes, so you guys are getting a bonus here. I write down um, um, the word courage. Yeah. And I go, what's the opposite of courage? People go, oh, cowardice. I go, cool. And I write down the word courage. And then in front of it, I write these letters. D-I-S. The opposite of courage is discouraged. It's when we create the movie in our mind that discourages us from stepping into the fire, from moving towards the danger, whatever that danger is. So. The only way to get us moving, to create this, this, this movement towards our, well, we've got our comfort zone, discomfort zone, our holy shit zone. To make our holy shit zone smaller, like we get a fear spike, is you gotta be brave. 
And that could be going to the dentist, it could be quitting your job, it could be sitting down with your wife, it could be someone's following you, they want to fight you. The only way you get into the fight is to be brave. Now, obviously there's more training and research. Someone could say, I want to learn to defend myself. You need more than just courage, or, or you don't need just more than courage, let me restate that. Having good skills plus courage is a bonus. Yeah, but exactly. It's, but it starts with managing Engaging. Yeah. All the training in the world does nothing if you're gonna, yeah, if you're the, gonna freeze at, at the end situation. of the day, mind navigates the body, and there's tons of yeah. examples of really well-trained people in the stock market, in gunfights, in sports, who choked. What's the difference between choking and freezing, or, or is it semantic? Choking and freezing, semantics, could be the same. An untrained person, I don't know what to do, freezes. A trained person chokes. They let the fear get of the them. outcome yeah, get, that. get to themselves. Yeah, they weren't supposed to be in that situation. They freeze. That makes sense. But an untrained person can have a one in a million shot if sure. they engage, right? 100%. Because that bravery takes over. And and this is the interesting thing is that there are more people who successfully defend themselves with no martial art training than there ever will be martial artists who get trained. Like right now, every three seconds, somebody's getting attacked somewhere. We only hear about the victims. We don't hear about the people that got away, that fought back. That's right? true. So, so there are more people who just through, will, through sheer will and indignation, in, and indignation is a really special type of anger. It's not like, I'm angry. The indignation is a kind of like, how fucking dare you? And that's a really powerful tool when someone's coming after you or your family. Oh, oh yeah. Well, appreciate you coming out today, Tony. My Man. friend. Thank you for this. Thank uh, you so much. I feel like we just got a private seminar. What a great we, podcast. We kind of did. Thank you guys. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I, uh, I plan on, uh, there was a lot of, obviously, as we get to talk and do these things, I always apply whatever I can learn from our guests to my, my own life and my own thought process. And it, it, uh, it definitely, uh, I, I, I know all those moments that we have. So it, having a tool bag to, to try to. It, it's, it's literally as simple as fuck fear, remember the acronym, yeah. face it, understand it, control it, know it. That will short circuit the like floundering three days of you going, shit, what mm -hmm. am I gonna do? Yeah, because you know? and and it's it, not productive. It's Time, not right. Our, it's, our, our it's real not. asset. And 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 uh, I mean, I know I know we're trying to wrap this, but I don't know if we have got time for one crazy business story. Let's, uh, let's hear it. Do yeah. we have time? A minute. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you heard about uh, two weeks to flatten the curve. You guys heard about that yeah. rebound? Yeah. That all that was a mm -hmm. joke. Um, all my business is was live and in person three years ago. All my business, all live and in person. My high gear is all first responders. Two weeks to flatten the curve becomes three months. I now canceled 35 classes. Uh, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars of training. I'm, you know, for in the beginning, it was like, this is cool. I'll be home with the wife, the family, the kids. This is cool, you know. And then all of a sudden, I'm like doing the accounting in my brain. I go and I look around my office and I go, I'm going to lose everything because it was literally like <clears throat> faucets off because I didn't have any digital, I didn't have any online stuff. And, uh, when I realized that, it was like someone stuck a fucking vacuum up my ass and was sucking out my insides. And I'm sitting at my desk and I lean forward and I'm like, oh shit, big fear spike. And I'm visualizing the movie started. Holy shit, holy shit. I'm losing everything. the irrelevant shit, the watches, the cards, the fucking material bullshit. The, the that leads to the structural shit. And then, okay, I, I don't want to have a house. I can't feed my family. What are we gonna do? Holy shit, I gave myself 24 hours to fucking whine and be a pussy and commiserate. My wife called me in, I couldn't eat. I was, she said, dinner. I come in, I'm like doing this. She goes, what's the matter? Why aren't you hungry? And you know, you're captain of the ship. We're not going, we're going down. Right? Yeah. It's like, I had a protein shake like an hour ago. I fucking f forgot dinner. Like, you know, you know, uh, I'm, I'm cool. Next morning, I call my whole team together. I go, guys, uh, we need to pivot really fast. Within three months, we had three new websites, contacted all my, fortunately, a lot of my material is cerebral, it's educational, it's inspirational. So if you can change somebody's mind, you, you, can, you can make that shift, like that guy who, you know, uh, li listened to the podcast, uh, or sorry, the No Fear program five times, anxiety's gone. Other people might have it for five years, in five days his was gone, light switch for him. And, um, it, it was it was 
crazy. I immediately, uh, do you know Steve Weatherford? So he's a, he's a, a big fitness influencer online, ex NFL, uh, great guy. I'm talking to him like right at the height of this. I go, Steve, uh, you got any uh, ideas for me how to save my business? Because I'm fucking. He goes, aren't you like a famous self defense guy? I go, yeah, that's the rumor. He goes, why don't you do something on Zoom? And I'd been teaching online before for years with my team it was WebEx and, and Skype. And what I did was uh, camera, phone, told everyone, hey guys, everything's tied up. All first responders are deployed. It's right in the beginning, right? Everyone's working, nobody's training. This is before, before defund the police. So there's nothing coming in. A lot of you can't afford to train with me one-on-one. -on -one. You can't get the seminars because of geography. So I'm going to start training in the gym. We're going to be uh, talking fear and self-defense because the riots were starting to happen. We had 100 people sign up like, like right away. And that saved my business. That, and it was crazy. The first class, and here's the whole point of the story. Um, the first class, I'm walking around the house like this. And my wife says to me, are you okay? I go, yeah, fucking anxiety. She goes, about what? I, sh I go, it's the, first, it's the first class of the garage gym. She goes, what, do you, what could you possibly, you're the best spear instructor in school, in the, in the world. You can't catch COVID through Zoom. These people are paying you. What the hell are you nervous for? And I said, because I need this to work. And it's not lost to me that I started my business in a garage and now I'm going to save it in our garage. And that pressure created anxiety, but the pressure like creating the diamond, the fact that, and this is a public speaking tip for you, that allowed me to step in and start with the audience going, let me tell you how important this is to me. And let me tell you, I'm nervous about your response to that because I need to make you safer and we're going to have this reciprocal relationship. It was just like this great opening speech. And then everyone, and here we are years later. I still, I still do that four times a week. I don't need to anymore. But it's like this community that started because I was so scared. And the only way to manage the fear was to manage my mind. And that's what created those new business opportunities. But I was afraid, like a public speaker, to start this thing. But instead of fear of the unknown, Brian, it was fear of the known. And when you can identify fear of the known, you can lean into it. You can strategize. Anyways, I wanted to share that with you guys. I like that. So. Well, thank you for making it out, Tony. Thank you, sir. Make sure you guys like, comment, subscribe. See you on the next one.